Most people who come to therapy have, you know, long-standing ingrained problems that they've been struggling with for years that took years or decades or a lifetime to develop. And the idea that you're going to change lifelong patterns in a matter of weeks is just absurd on the face of it. So, you know, an analogy is how long does it take to learn a, a, a new skill, not something trivial, but you know, something meaningful. How long does it take to learn a new language to the point that you can, you know, have a conversation in a foreign language? It takes a long time. And if somebody said, I'm gonna make you an expert in this in six weeks or eight weeks, you know, I think most people would intuitively understand that, that you know, somebody is trying to sell them snake oil. No worries, you know, give me eight hours, give me eight therapy sessions, and we're gonna change the trajectory of, trajectory of your life. It's like, it, it just sounds ludicrous. And, and, it, and it should sound ludicrous because we have research that tells us how long meaningful therapy takes. But that's not what researchers are studying. So what do they do? We study eight to 12 sessions, not because research tells us that people get better in eight to 12 sessions or even improve in meaningful ways. We just declare upfront, like this is going to be an eight to 12 session therapy. We show some trivial and temporary, you know, benefit on, on some rating scale afterwards. And then we declare the therapy to be the gold standard. And the fact that six months out, the majority of patients are already looking for more therapy for exactly the same thing. Maybe we, we don't pay attention to that. We have researchers telling us that treatment is done after eight to 12 sessions. And what serious clinicians know, and patients who have, who have had meaningful therapy know, is therapy is barely getting started. Usually, you know, a few months into it, you start hearing things that the person never brought up in the first place. And the people who are only doing and only studying short-term therapies never hear those things. They're living in a parallel universe where like, they're, not, they're not encountering it. So as far as they're concerned, it doesn't exist and they don't need to study it. So, I mean, the public, and not just the public, like mental health, mental health practitioners also, are being sold a bill of goods about what treatment is, number one, what treatment is supposed to do. And even if we accept, you know, the research academic psychologist definition of what tre treatment is supposed to do, we're being sold a bill of goods about how well it works, you know, e even accepting those assumptions. And I, I think the insurance industry, I mean, has done just inexpressible damage to psychotherapy and, and not just damage to people's understanding of what psychotherapy really is. Not only are we giving them bad care, but we're often telling them that they're getting the best care, right? I mean, it's a, it's a kind of a, you know, societal level gaslighting where, you know, we're simultaneously not doing right by people who need mental health care. And we're telling them that they're getting the gold standard treatment. And when the treatments fail, people don't, the, the patients don't come away and say, I didn't get adequate treatment. They come away and say, you know, I tried psychotherapy and it doesn't help me. And it's like, no, they didn't. You know, they tried some, I don't know, cheap band-aid facsimile of psychotherapy, not psychotherapy. And they think they got the real deal and they didn't, and, right? So the effect of that is not only do we not help people, but now we have enormous numbers of people who we've convinced, you know, they, they think they're beyond the reach of psychotherapy. <laughs> it's really, really hard to do psychologically meaningful therapy research. And the problem is that people are trying to apply research methods to study psychotherapy that were actually designed for something completely different, right? The, the value of research findings depends on the assumptions that you make when you do the study, the assumptions of the methods, right? You have a placebo, you have a you know, an experimental drug, and what you're trying to do is compare them. There's a whole bunch of assumptions in the background. One is that everybody who gets the experimental drug is actually getting the same thing. And, you know, things that are different, like the doctor who's prescribing it, or the clinic, or the setting, or who the patient is, all of those things are going to average out. You know, it's, you know, it's the biological ingredient of the drug that makes a difference, and we can control that.
right? Precisely. We know what people are getting. And we know what a placebo means, right? A placebo means we're going to give you everything that the people who get the biological drug get. The entire same procedure, the same method, the same coming into the clinic, the same talking to a doctor. We're going to give you some, a pill to swallow, except it's not going to be biologically active. Assumption is we know a priori what the disease is. We know upfront what the disease is. We know what the symptoms are. And we know what improvement should look like. And improvement should look the same for every patient. So all of those are assumptions that are built in. Then we say, let's take, let's take all of these assumptions and somehow transpose them to studying psychotherapy. So first of all, is psychotherapy like, like a pill? It, it, it doesn't matter who the therapist is and who the patient is. It's the same intervention no matter what, right? That's not true, right? So no two therapists can deliver the same psychotherapy because they're different people. You can't separate you know, the, the, the sort of active ingredients of the treatment from the person who's providing it. The person who's providing it, they themselves as a human being, they are the treatment. It's the rhythms and patterns of, you know, of interacting that develop in a specific pair, patient, you know, patient and therapist pair. And what's more, we're not in agreement up front about what the disease is and what the cure is supposed to look like. That may be different for every single person. So we take these research methods, this research design, the randomized control trial or the RCT, and we just transpose it over to another topic area that it wasn't designed for. And when researchers come out and say it's statistically significant, you know, it's scientifically proven, it's evidence-based, it's the gold standard. None of those terms mean anything. They, so, I mean, the public, and not just the public, like mental health, mental health practitioners also, are being sold a bill of goods about what treatment is, number one, what treatment is supposed to do. And even if we accept, you know, the research academic psychologist definition of what tre treatment is supposed to do, we're being sold a bill of goods about how well it works, you know, e even accepting those assumptions. And that a lot of people, a lot of therapists who actually do the work, including me, will tell you flat out, it just doesn't fit. You're trying to, you know, you're trying to push a square, you know, a square peg into a round hole. We don't have the right methodology. And if you accept all of the false assumptions and you say therapy is like a drug and we can separate the therapy from the therapist who's delivering it and the patient who's receiving it and the context and the rhythms of their interactions. Uh, if, if we assume all of that, then we're going to show a benefit for this specific, you know, treatment modality. And even when you do all of that, what the research, if you assume that the purpose of therapy is nothing but to reduce your score on a, on a depression scale, Right? Forget about everything else going on in the person's life. Right? Forget about, are they happily engaged in the world? Can they you know, use their energy you know, effectively and meaningfully? Can they connect meaningfully with other people? Can they, they form meaningful and lasting relationships? If we throw all of that out and we say we're concerned with nothing except their score on the depression scale, even then, <laughs> These therapies fail most people most of the time. Are people getting well? Is this um, having a positive impact in people's lives in a way that actually makes a meaningful difference to them? Right? Are, are people, um, you know, are, are people finding relief from? the difficulties that, that brought them there, and, and are they able to maintain their gains over time? And, and we actually have research provides answers to all those questions, and for most people, most of the time, the answer is absolutely no. What we have, especially in like PhD clinical psychology programs, is we have like the, the next generation of clinical practitioners being trained by people who aren't clinicians themselves and aren't experts in, in what they're teaching. And you know, this forms the students' ideas about what psychotherapy is. And like I said at the very beginning, we don't know what we don't know. And then my teachers, my esteemed teachers, are te this is what good therapy looks like. And they just have no clue what really good therapy looks like. It's not in their repertoire of experience. They've never encountered it.